Welcome. Thank you for getting up this early. Um, and welcome to this Edinburgh TV Festival Masterclass for the BBC One hit comedy, Ghosts. Um, before I bring out the people you're all here to see, um, just to let you know, uh, there might be time at the end for some questions. That's the good news. Um, but the bad news is that you need the festival app, which I know not everyone, everyone will have. But if you do have it, um, you can submit questions that way. And, um, and we'll try and get them to them at the end of the, at the, end of the talk. Um, and one more thing, um, stick around to the very end because we have a very exciting treat slash surprise for you. Um, so um, I don't think anyone was going to walk out early. They're very nice. Um, but yeah, stay till the end because we've got a, a world exclusive for you. Okay, that's enough admin. Please welcome to the stage the stars and creative team behind Ghosts, Matthew Bainton, Jim Howick, Lolly and Fopi, Kyle smith Bino, and the Ghost executive producer, Alison Carpenter, and John Petrie, director of BBC Comedy. <laughs> Jim, get off your phone. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Welcome. Thanks for coming and getting up early. Um, let's go right back to the beginning. Let's do the origin story, because, you know, that's where we should start. Um, you guys share a lot of history together. Obviously, you and absent but, but still loved Simon Farnaby, Lawrence Ricard, Ben Wilbond, Martha Howe Douglas, and you, Matthew Bainton, and you, Jim Howick. Um, you started out on Horrible Histories. Is that the first time you all worked together? It's the first time you. we worked together. Uh, Jim had worked with Simon on Captain V. Can I get a... No. Do you want to know? <laughs> <laughs> that was a Channel 4 comedy lab. That was our first... Incidentally, our first TV jobs. Yeah. Um, ben I met in 99, just after he won the Perrier Best Newcomer with Arne Widdison. Um, and our, the sketch group I was in supported his sketch group. And so, yeah, we knew each other before Horrible Histories. And Matt, Larry and Martha I met on the, on the job itself. So Horrible Histories, um, it's kind of like TV's One Direction. You were assembled as a pop group, yeah. and now you're all Harry Styles? I yeah. think that's fair to say. Um, how did you go from being <laughs> actors working on a job to wanting to write together? What it, happened there? It just was, a, uh, I guess, a long enough job, because we did it for five years, that we, and uh, there was a bigger cast, but some people who came and went, and we were less busy, I guess. <laughs> So we stayed on it. We just loved working together. We just really enjoyed working together. And as what we thought would be the end of Horrible Histories, actually, was, was that series five. And we just began to talk about it would be a shame not to be, spend our time making each other laugh anymore. In, in Elizabethan roughs. In, yeah, <laughs> ideally in silly costumes. And so we sort of said, well, let's have a go at creating something together. So we'd all written variously for things of our own outside of it. Um, and we just got in a room and started coming up with ideas. And that was a show called Yonderland, which we made for... So that was the first idea you had? I think so. There's because nothing we were, on, the, on the cutting room floor that you sort of discarded. There was before Ghosts, but post Yonderland. But I think Yonderland was the first idea after Horrible Histories. because. Wow. Literally, we were just going, OK, how can we continue to play multi-characters yeah. but not do a sketch show because we'd be in the shadow of horrible histories? And fantasy was, like, very quickly, was like, oh, well, that's how we could do that. Mm -hmm. We all loved things like Labyrinth, and mm -hmm. we all loved the idea of working with Henson-style puppets. And um, it was just greedy, basically. How can, how can we do something that has hundreds of characters, but they're only played by us? Yeah, I like it. I know in particular as well, wigs is quite a big thing with you, isn't it? Do you always have the biggest wig? Uh, me? <laughs> I've I, heard this about you. Well, you I, was, I was hoisted by my own petard on the Yonderland. <laughs> we had these characters called the Elders, which we thought at the time, if I remember rightly, like we were, when we were working on the the pilot, they were going to be this set-up-the-world kind of group. And we, we never thought you'd see them again. And so when the makeup designer asked me what I wanted my elder to look like, <laughs> I improvised what I thought sounded really funny, which was, I'd like him to have a, a hair like two scoops of ice cream. <laughs> 
and a huge beard which comes down and then round and into the hair <laughs> so that it's like this That's big That's quite specific, swirl. Matt. <laughs> really specific. And she was like, yeah, okay. So then I had this incredibly heavy, uncomfortable wig, and then, the, and then those characters were really fun, so we wrote them back in, and I found myself having to put that on constantly, and now I just avoid that stuff if I possibly no can. No wigs. That's a clause now. No wigs. Yeah, okay. although I did wear a wig for Thomas on the new series. But what? Oh, did you? Yeah. <laughs> did you not know? No. What happened? <laughs> Why? I had... Uh, short hair for another job. Oh, fair enough. But okay. also, to tell, the, uh, to tell the truth, like, I'm going grey. <laughs> Thomas is a ghost, so he can't change. Let's die. Let's like, die. They've been, like, painting out the, the temple greys. Yeah. And they're like, we're now just painting all of uh, your hair. Yeah, okay. So, <laughs> maybe a wig is easier. <laughs> so, um, Alison, you met these guys, came on board at Yonderland stage, right? That's where yeah, you kind of I'd, joined in. I'd worked with Ben on a sketch show previously, and then with Shunad William, who's a brilliant producer, had been sort of mentoring me, and she was doing some consulting with me at Working Title for some comedy shows. So we started talking to Ben, and it was at that time when they were coming to the end of Horrible Histories and thinking what they wanted to do next. And my memory, actually, you can tell me if this is really what was going on. We've never had this conversation, <laughs> I don't think. But um, Ben and Larry, um, said, we've got this idea, but it's like herding cats, and we need someone to put us in a room and get us to write it down. So we went, well, that seems quite easy. We can give you a room at Working Title. They've got lovely meeting rooms, <laughs> and we'll pay you to be there. And we did that, and two days later, the treatment was there. Yeah. Mm. Wow. Two days. Two days. Yeah. You did treatment in two days. Yeah, that's yeah. surprising. <laughs> I, was, I, was, I thought there would be like a, a road strewn with failed projects and, and well, your boats art, basically. It, it would be, I mean, we, I think we had a certain, like, we, we had a number of sort of ideas about characters and jokes and things that yeah. came about throughout yeah. the five years of Horrible Histories. Um, catchphrases yeah, and things like that that we, we would sort of film ourselves once we were ready to film a sketch about, you know, cavemen or sort of farming the first sort of farming mm. years, we would make our own sketch with our phones and things. So yeah. a lot of those characters and punchlines and things came about early. So it wasn't just two days. But Yonderland was your first shot and it and yeah, yeah. It. yeah. Wow, a lot of comedy writers are gonna hate you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, John, so um, like Alison, you've inherited these ghosts. You didn't you weren't at the BBC in no. your current job when they came along. Um, you had what, no choice. Yeah. Literally, literally didn't. I'm going to take choice. all the credit for it, though. <laughs> <laughs> was it Kate Dorton? Kate Dorton? Uh, well, it was even slight. Was it? It was Shane, Shane and Claire, wasn't it? Because yeah. Kate was on maternity leave yeah. at that point. But in fact, even before that, my family more was. Um, we, I remember we had a meeting where we were encouraged to come up with a sketch show mm. when we were still making Yonderland, and we were like, "We've the Yonderland is really hard, and we need to just focus <laughs> on that." And by the time we came back, my family wasn't there, but Shane was. And, uh, That's often yeah. the way, isn't it? For an executive who likes your idea will go. And, <laughs> yeah, and, yeah, 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 yeah. It's yeah. the Alan Partridge thing. Yeah. 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 <laughs> the Castrol DTX bomber jacket at the funeral. Um, <laughs> I'm digressing. Um, so, John, what, what is it do you think um, that the BBC loved about this idea, a ghost, and, and why they why they wanted just, to commission I think there are so few comedies that appeal to, that the whole family can watch. Mm. I just think it's the most lovely, heartwarming, uncynical show there is. It just, yeah. I, just, I, I was a mass, I was so chuffed to sort of have it and to sort of, um, yeah, be a champion for it. And now it's just, it's, it's amazing. Do you want some stats? Can I give you, you some stats? You, get, you're, you are the stats guy, <laughs> aren't stats. you? Uh, you can churn 60, out stats if you like. 64 million viewer hours for ghosts wow. in total. Isn't that amazing? Good lord. 64 million. And then the last series. <laughs> what does that mean? The last mean? series. I know, what does that mean? Million. It I've sounds got to great. Stats. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it's, it's, a, it's massive. It's a massive show. Yes. Yeah. yeah, it's great. And we just don't have anything else. Like it, and we'd love more. I talk know, we'll talk stuff. about that in a minute. Yeah. Um, and so, uh, Lolly and Kyle, um, what was casting like? How did you come on board? Um, I, I didn't actually do an audition. Um, they Sorry, begged me. what? <laughs> <laughs> this I is where no, no. up. This is terrible. I've 11 auditions. <laughs> 
<laughs> no, talk to me about how you got the part, and then we, we can come on to your business in a minute. Yeah. Um, <laughs> we just worked together. We did a show yeah. Loaded, yeah. and we got on very well. And then afterwards, I think you just text me and were like, do you want to be in this show? <laughs> wow. <laughs> yeah, it was. Yeah, I was making a, 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 a taster too. tape of this show called Ghosts, and would you like to be in it? And I was like, don't tell me anything more. <laughs> it's a yes. She hung up. <laughs> it's a no. Yeah. And um, I'm sorry to do this to you, but tell me about your audition. <laughs> uh, there were five. Oh. It was across like sort of five months. Uh, um, no, I um, I just got a, a, a self tape uh, uh, audition through um, to, to come and uh, do this thing, and I knew Tom Kingsley from doing stuff, and. Um, yeah, and then just like really worked hard at it because I, I, as soon as I read it, I was like, I have, I have to play this. Did part. you? It was one of those. Yeah, yeah, and I, um, I, I've said this before on on some other things, but I, um, I was dating at the time, and yeah, and nice. um, <laughs> I would practice with a lot of my dates. I'd practice the wow. the. the Audition. Are we talking a lot of different dates? Or? Yeah. Wow. You know, I was, I was, you know, I was out there, I was 21. Or so. but, um, and, uh, yeah, so there's, there's probably a few girls out there that are like, it's, it's, I got it's it. yeah, yeah, it's because of me. <laughs> um, but, yeah, I really, really wanted it. And, and um, it was actually only one audition, I think. Yeah, there was one audition. Oh, yeah, and then the chemistry the test. Chemistry yeah, yeah, yeah. But, yeah. Was there like a Charlotte Ritchie and you chemistry kind of audition? Because if you're playing someone's spouse, it's kind of ideal yeah, yeah. you get on. Yeah, yeah, so we did that and then uh, did the chemistry test and, and um, read with uh, four actresses and, and I had no idea how you guys were going to pick because everyone was really great. Did you yeah. already know that you'd got it? No, oh, wow. no, because there were two guys. <laughs> so the other guy is now eating your dust. At least you've got that. I killed him. Even though it wasn't a text <laughs> casting. The thing that was amazing about Kyle's audition, if, uh, if you if I can blow smoke for a little while, <laughs> is that Jeez. we'd selected, for that chemistry one, we'd selected a few scenes which were really for us to look at the Allisons, and a few scenes which were for, kind of for us to look at the mics. And in the scenes where they weren't picked to audition you, you were being really... Fu they were mostly scenes where she's talking to the ghosts, and you were so funny in those scenes. Doing, he, you know, he really picked up on... A, a layer of comedy that we hadn't really thought about all that much, which is just Mike as, as a spare, as a lemon, <laughs> <laughs> while she's talking to the ghosts. And yeah. it, you know, so it was just full of him sort of going. Yeah, only then did it occur to us that that was Just staying alive through all of her stuff. Yeah. And that's, that, that was the thing we were like, oh, that's so, yeah. that's so much of what he's going to do is this. Mm. And he's making us laugh in places we didn't know yeah. he would. Yeah. It was brilliant. Amazing. You've got the, you've got the part. Yeah? Yeah. <laughs> <Definitely>. You're in. <laughs> um, so, John, to come back to the, the commissioning stage, and I want to talk to all of you about this, but um, the pilot, as I understand it, if this isn't being indiscreet, mm. the pilot wasn't what you wanted it to be at all. Is that right? You're not completely flawless, like no, the, no, the initial we, half hour. Yeah. To be completely candid, I think we can say this, but we were offered a broadcast yeah. thing, the, the Playhouse um, thing. So where you do, you make a pilot, and you but make they show it. half hour yeah. and, it sh and it showed. And we were sort of adamant that the point of making a pilot for us would, would be to make some mistakes, potentially, sure. and mm -hmm. learn from them. And so we begged and pleaded, can we, can we please make something Mm -hmm. And we made a sort of taster that was like a third of a pilot or something like yeah. that. And it taught us a huge amount. I mean, the biggest thing actually was that originally, as I alluded to earlier, we're very greedy actors. We were going to have a, a house that was so endless that you would discover new ghosts every week. Right. And, uh, and so the, the end was the same scene as ended up in series one, which is that Alison can now see ghosts. Uh, Mike comes in, sees the look on her face, mistakes it for being kind of overwhelmed at the project they've taken on. Meanwhile, behind him, through the walls, these ghosts are coming in. And mm -hmm. she's like, ah. 
in the taster tape, that was a sort of shot where we locked off and then we were like eight ghosts, went and got changed, eight more, went and got changed, oh, eight wow. more, and did this ballroom full of ghosts. Yeah. And the biggest lesson from that taster was we looked at it and went, this is, in terms of premise, this is wrong. Right. Because this feels like it's telling us it wants to be about people who are stuck together with people they can't get on with. Yeah. And if you've got 100 people, we were talking about kids earlier and going yeah. to a school with a population big enough that you can find your crew. If yeah. you're a misfit, you know, or whatever. Mm. If, you, if, 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 if there's 100 ghosts, they can all just find some friends yeah. and avoid the ones they don't like. Yeah. And, you know, if we'd done that and aired it, it's much harder to then sort of go away and come back with something that's different or repackaged or yeah. whatever. It's a, weird, it's a weird thing. I don't... There's no other genre show all their homework. Like, for some reason, for eight for years, comedy always had pilots. And actually, out of all the genres, it's like... Because there's, there's so many things in comedy that, in the script, you, can, you can't... Like, I remember someone saying, like, the in-betweeners, you know, the dance that Neil does that became, like, the iconic... That just said, Neil does a dance in the script, <laughs> and it became... There's so many things in comedy that funny people just find mm. that... Yeah, that's why it's vital to pilot, and, I, yeah, I find it weird that... Yeah. And, if, um, Alison, when you make a pilot and it doesn't work, um, is that a difficult conversation? Does everyone get back round the table and start again, or...? Um, well, do you feel like giving up? I, I'm in a really lucky position where I haven't ever had to do that. Um, and with this, I think, and I think the other thing about this process is we knew that the comedy was going to work because it's the, to, you know, it's the tone of Yonder, it's the tone of what these guys do. So that wasn't really what we needed to test. So in terms of what works, it was as Matt was saying, it's have we got the right premise? The other thing was that Humphrey was going to be a bigger character than Robin originally. And I think on a recce day with the director, I just went, oh, this is going to be an absolute nightmare. Like, and also, it was becoming apparent that actually Robin was going to be a really, really funny character and much more unusual. Yeah. And um, so I think that was the other thing that we discovered through the pilot, to flip that around and make Robin more of a key character. So I think in this situation, it was a very nice, just open discussion of what does everyone think, what worked, what didn't, what do we want to change? And as we're saying, we have the luxury of not being stuck with anything. Yeah, cool. Um, so, John, we've had um, conversations about family sitcoms and how hard they are, and um, much harder, perhaps, than a post-watershed thing where you can be edgy or sweary. Or, um, and obviously, Ghost is like the ultimate family sitcom because they're not just kind of like a flat share. They're one of those... It's one of those comedies like Red Dwarf or Blackadder or Porridge or Father Ted where there's a family is being represented, even if they're not actually related. Um, but you don't get pitched family comedies, like family-friendly family stuff, do you? No, do you want to open the, <laughs> the no, floodgates no, yeah, to this now? It's, it, I mean, you do, but it's just much less than... And I don't... I don't Why is I don't, that? I don't, I don't know. I mean, you as creators, like, do you... I don't know, I suppose... There's um, probably a feeling that... Go, and we knew, we knew this, you know, and, and Shane had said it to us before, we don't get pitched enough for BBC One and y y you guys have, have got that audience in your previous work. And, mm. But you do feel a little bit like going for that slot is, is painting a target on your back a little bit. It's, it's a sort of much more head above the parapet kind mm. of thing to do, mm. I suppose. I think there's a history with, with those mainstream sitcoms of you know, quite vicious criticism when it doesn't work. Mm -hmm. um, so there's that, um, but obviously it didn't, that didn't put us off. But yeah. I think it's just a natural thing. It would be kind of ridiculous for our group with its history to try and create something that has a hard edge like Peep <laughs> Show or a real sort of yeah. adult theme. Yeah. Um, I think a lot it's of just it a is natural that fit, really. like comics and creators want to be cool. <laughs> you know, and it's like, I, I think it, part of it is just get, getting over yourself and mm -hmm. being like, I'll make something that people will like, and that's more important than whether my peers think I'm edgy. Yeah. yeah. But there's something about the tone of ghosts, I think, that we all think Matt's edgy. <laughs> <laughs> In fact, the real punk thing to do is to make a BBC One sick. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> 
<laughs> but there is, there, there's something about the tone of ghost that's both very inclusive, and I think just in terms of, I don't know, do you have stats on demographics? Because anecdotally, I feel like grandchildren to grandparents, everyone watches Ghost. It's not a, a, a specific. I don't do you know? Do you know? No, I don't. You don't? Okay, you well, then. So stats sorry. earlier. In the <laughs> <laughs> so you you know. are stats. <laughs> Is right from my putting together award submissions. Ah, right okay. <laughs> <laughs> it is so inclusive. It is what's prevalent. Yeah, I think the, the de demographic is broad. And also, just anecdotally, especially actually during lockdown, yeah. I was hearing from like, loads of my mum's friends, basically, who don't always watch stuff I make. Ev like, from every possible bit of life, people telling me that they were watching it. Or, yeah. And it yeah, it I think it saved a lot of people's lockdowns. I think there were two shows, Taskmaster and Ghost, yeah, it was Taskmaster that seemed to gather families back around the central, you know, the central mm. fireplace that is television. Um, in, in terms of that, after lockdown, are you rethinking sort of the family sitcom? Because there seems to be two stories that have come out of the pandemic. One is that we all fragmented, went to our separate screens and ignored each other. And one is that, well, some shows did seem to bring us together. Can you distill down like what that is and get the families back around the TV again? Is that something you're looking to do or not? <laughs> yeah, no, def yeah, definitely. Um, but we can sort of put the call out. We just sort of hope that producers respond and creative people want to, yeah. to do it. Um, but yeah, obviously, it would be amazing. Yeah. OK, let's talk a bit about the characters, because obviously that's kind of where the comedy comes from. That's where the sentiment and the, and the, the lovely sort of big-hearted feeling comes from. Um, how did you choose those eras, those specific characters from those time periods? Um, well, I don't think we sort of specifically sat down and, and, and with a sort of calendar. It was more about what's funny. Mm -hmm. And the first characters were born from um, a bit, really. So, like, the first kind of glimpses of Pat in the room were, was his death. Um, so it could have been anyone from any time, but yeah. we just thought, wouldn't it be funny if Jim a... Jim just got up and played out. <laughs> I just did it. <laughs> the thing. Yeah. It's harrowing, yeah, the scene where your character's shot in the neck. I, I watched it again yesterday and genuinely still find it quite hard to watch. Yeah. yeah. Very convincing. <laughs> yeah, we wanted to do this sort of Scorsese death where it's sort of so unexceptional, it seems almost more violent. It's, it is, it's, the, because it's so low-key. So, yeah. yeah. Um, that he almost doesn't know where he is. It's like, huh, is this a dream? <laughs> um, <laughs> rather than a sort of, you know, a, a kind of uh, Robin Hood, Prince of Thieves, death sort yeah. of Yeah, there's thing. no blood, which I obviously yeah. is probably yeah. A, yeah. a watershed thing, but also it's even more affecting somehow. It's like, oh, God. Yeah. <laughs> there's a yeah. Hitchcock quote, isn't there, about, like, it takes ages for a person to die. Oh, lovely. <laughs> yeah, it's horrible. <laughs> but it's sort of partly that, just going, like, we sort of try, as broad and silly and mainstream as this sitcom is, mm -hmm. we often think the most interesting thing to do is to lean as far as we can within those confines into truth. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. And we sort of try and ask ourselves, okay, what's, what's actually really, really the truthful reaction to, to this absurd thing, whatever it is? Mm -hmm. And Pat's death is a good example of that, of just like, it, he could just keel over and die, but he wouldn't. <laughs> He's so bleak. Yeah. But the fact he gets into the van and starts up the engine, like, and he has and to break off the, the arrow yeah. to get yeah. through yeah. the yeah. door because it's too yeah. narrow. Yeah, he goes, oh, seatbelt. He's already Why are you the putting your seatbelt on? <laughs> <laughs> Just get to the hospital. It's like, um, yeah. But and so that, that was sort of playing on the bus radio. That status quo. Yeah. It's the wanderer, yeah. Just, which yeah. somehow makes it worse. Yeah. yeah. And there were yeah. lots but, of choices for that. <laughs> yeah. And the yeah. other the other characters really I can't I can't really remember. And it's a, com mean, it's a combination of two things, right? Because one was ticking off. There are certain ghost archetypes that it would be abs that you sort of have to yeah. do. Mm. And so we need you know you had to have like the grey lady, yeah. and you had to have the headless horseman or, mm -hmm. or Judah or whatever. And then some of the others were like sort of based on the opposite, which is like the absurdity of, of what our ghost mythology is, mm. for example, that you don't get ghosts earlier than Tudors, yeah. and yet human history is hundreds yes. and hundreds of thousands of millions of years or whatever. Yeah. And so the idea of a caveman one made us all laugh, mm -hmm. and it was, yeah, the modern back mm. to the old, just sort of finding that spread. But was that always gonna be uh, Larry that played that part? Well, he's the only one who can bear to have that amount of makeup. Yeah. I mean, we, when we were talking about that switch, because he really felt 
that he would that Humphrey would be the main character and you'd see yeah. glimpses of the caveman. Yeah. And as Alison said in, in the taster, we watched it and we're like, the caveman is great, people are gonna love it. Yeah. And it's probably the other way around. Yeah. And we did kind of have to talk Larry down from yeah. the ledge. Yeah. <laughs> she was Does like, that's two hours, two and, well. and a half hours of makeup <laughs> every morning. Yeah. And we were like, but everyone will love you. <laughs> <laughs> and it's true. Please, they do. and they yeah. do. Yeah. And he think takes it like a trooper. <laughs> <laughs> no, none of us, apart from Larry and, and Martha, would, you know, put up with that every morning. We just wouldn't. He's I mean, we'd all complain. Yeah. It's yeah. Just he's also a very good physical performer. Yeah, yeah. he does enjoy you know, the transformation. He's an excellent sort of clown. So, um, um, he, so in he, a way, he should thank us. In the Underland, he, he uh, <laughs> often played sort of elderly characters yeah. and kind of, you know... Deformed, you know, yeah, sort yeah, of, yeah, yeah, things. But yeah, he's a character actor for sure. Yes. Mm. Yeah. And um, but it's that they just maybe it's an accident, maybe it's design, but they cover a really good range of periods in history. So oh, it seems a lot of the stories come from either you know an Edwardian attitude to sex in terms of you know Martha's character or um, yeah, or Julian obviously is a brilliant kind of distilled bubble of like eighties Toryism. It they 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 have extra layers to them other than just the people, which yeah. seems to really give the show kind of a 3D element. Um, I want to try um, playing a clip now, dare we use technology. Um, let's have a look at Kyle's character, because I want to talk to you about having, I think, the hardest job on that set. <laughs> <laughs> So, Kyle, not only, I mean, you, you do hear people sometimes who say they're in a special effects film and they're acting to thin air and that's really difficult. Your job is almost the opposite. So quite often you're trying to act to thin air while surrounded by these people being really funny at you. Like, how do you do that? Um, I don't <laughs> really know. <laughs> um, it's, it's, it's hard. And every time we go back and start a new series, it's um, something that I've got to remember. And the first few days are always like, oh, yeah, I can't, yeah, I can't do that. Um, <laughs> and um, it's a lot of fun. And I think that something that I, I tried to always add was, um, was Mike looking the wrong way or looking up um, because he thinks a ghost float. <laughs> so, so I think there were loads of like, little things that are actually tricks because if I look up, I don't have to look at the actors, um, and bits like that, which I, I find funny and hoped yeah. that everyone else would. <laughs> and you think you're presumably filming things a lot more than, well, you, you don't think filming things once anyway, but you must be repeatedly doing scenes with them and then without them. Yeah, and we always, for some reason, do the, the version with the ghosts first. So um, Charlotte has, I, just, I call it an easy ride. Um, <laughs> she does. <laughs> um, and, and we see, um, we do the interactions with the ghosts first and then, I take them away, and then I get to do it as it would be in the, yeah. in real life. Yeah. And what's um, in terms of the fan response? Obviously, the show is huge now, and it's sold all over the world. Um, and you talked about being in the Pleasance Courtyard last night. People do sort of go, ah. So you're, you know, you're very well known now. Do you? Is there a post bag anymore? Is it electronic now? But do you get fan mail? Um, occasion. Yeah, quite, quite a lot, quite a bit. It's not as much as we used to get. Yeah. Oh, you're um, I think the, the, well, we used to get lots of art and stuff. Did you? Um, because our fans were like 11, stuff, and now our fans are 25. <laughs> yeah. So, um, yeah, we don't so much now. The but, delivery yeah. system is different. Right? Yes. Children yes. send you a drawing they've done. Yeah. Adults post stuff on Instagram. What stuff? Oh, as in fan art. art. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, here's a picture of my pants. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And um, is it impolite to ask, is there a most popular ghost? Oh, that, well. I mean, Kitty's pretty popular, I think. <laughs> Kitty, Kitty has sort of this, she's on this voyage of discovery constantly, so she's quite a modern character, actually. Yeah. Um, and because all the costumes most kind of useful, useful. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Children connect with Kitty yeah. quite well. Yeah. Well, let's, let's have a look at another clip now, because um, I want to talk about uh, your character, Lolly. Um, this is a clip, I think it's quite a heart-rending one, where you're talking about your mean sister. Mm -hmm. So let's have a look at that now. <laughs> <laughs> so, 
So, Lolly, how much of do you all know your backstories when you start this show, or is that done developed over the series? Um, I don't. Not when we started. I didn't know Kitty's death, <gasps> um, but I knew her past. I knew a bit about her sister. That she had a sister. The relationship they kind of had, um, but it's very top secret. Yeah. So, are we? Is it? Am I allowed to ask? Is it this series that we're going to find out how Kitty dies? Have to watch. <laughs> <laughs> that was clearly the poker faces say, I'm not telling you. Um, is there, because obviously you, obviously you and Kyle are performing in this, but you're a brilliant stand-up and you're a writer too. Um, and I just wanted to say, if you haven't seen Red Flag on all four, it's one of the funniest things Thank you. I've ever seen. Really great. Very great. Um, uh, but so do you ever collaborate on the script? I know some comedy is done kind of as it's shot collaboratively, or is, is the script nailed down when you get there? It's pretty nailed down. Um, I think we do a lot of improvisation and like mm. we we like discuss stuff um, about like how Kitty would react to certain things. Um, but I mean, there's like six of them, so I think they kind of nail it before we get there. Are you saying they bully you? <laughs> yeah, <that's>... yeah. <laughs> I wanted to talk about that. <laughs> um, but yeah, the scripts are so good already, so that it's like yeah. you don't need a seventh or eighth person, I think. And I think looking at that clip as well, the, um, it's, and maybe it's developed more over the series, but there's such a lot of scope in terms of your performances as well to, to play really sad moments and really difficult moments. Mm. Is, um, did you expect that when you were coming on board to essentially play in a comedy? Um, I don't know, actually. I think like knowing that it's a show that deals with death, maybe it was kind of in the back of my mind, but I hadn't really thought that far ahead to like, OK, I'm going to be sort of flexing different like acting muscles mm. um but it's like just like a nice surprise to be like okay this is actually going to be like a way to show versatility um and it makes like the comedy like sort of hit even harder and the like pathos hit even harder when you've got like both of them together i think mm. well let's talk a bit about filming now um uh, if we've got time Gone, we have got time because this is always great fun. I really like the tradition at the end of every series where everyone's sad, Ghost is finished, and then you on YouTube always release a blooper reel. Yeah. So let's have a little look at those now because they're always <laughs> stunning. So it seems a lot of the um, sort of unintentional humour comes from bits of business mm. because obviously you're all comic performers and improvisers and you can do that too. It seems to be two things that keep coming up again and again. Um, Jim suddenly doing something with your voice that they weren't expecting, or Simon making one of his noises. <laughs> we need to talk about Simon's lexicon of noises, <laughs> because he seems to introduce a new one every series almost. Yeah. Are you the worst culprit for making other people laugh? Or is there? I just like to explore options <laughs> on the day. <laughs> yeah. um, that's a good indication, actually, is what, you know, even though the scripts are quite locked down plot wise. Mm -hmm. um, that's kind of some of that makes it, <laughs> yeah. and that's open for all of us. So, yeah, yeah. yeah I, I, I guess um, probably you're the worst. Maybe you love it. It's not. I, it's not misbehaving <laughs> though. <laughs> it's just experimenting. Fine. No good. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and let's talk about the other character in the show. The house obviously is a huge part of what makes that work. Um, Alison, how did you find, I know it's been used for filming before, but how did you find somewhere so perfectly set up to be Button House? Because it's slightly dilapidated, some work's been done, like, where did it come from? Just a really brilliant location scout. So this was for the taster tape. We just had a day where we visited maybe three or four places, and I can't remember where this came amongst them. Um, and they were all kind of good, but not quite right, and we're thinking, well, that room would be sort of okay, and we can do it for the pilot, but what would happen after that? And then we got to West Horsley, and yeah, it was just right. It was, I mean, that level of dilapidation, as you say, was just completely perfect because we, the BBC are very kind to us, but it's still always an incredibly, incredibly tight budget. So just not, it sounds stupid, but not having to spend money to make it look more crap mm -hmm. was going to be brilliant for us. It was just like But they've that. got like lottery funding now, haven't they? Are you worried that it's going to look too good by the time you finish filming? <laughs> Quite slow progress. And it's actually really good things because now there's some heating, there's some toilets in the house now. So like over the, <laughs> over the series, it's got a bit nicer to shoot in, hasn't it? Yeah. It's not yeah. quite so cold. You don't want to know what we were doing before. <laughs> 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 
<laughs> Obviously, up until um, earlier this year, when he very sadly died, it was Bamba Gascoigne's unexpectedly inherited yeah. house, right? So the story yeah. was the story was kind of the story of our bio. It was someone who died with very few close relations. Bamba Gascoigne inherited. The so parallels was, were genuinely like. Yeah. Wow. Did you ever get to meet him? Aww. No. Well, I, I don't know. Did, was he ever around when you guys? He was there. I know. Oh, really? Yeah. Yeah. I think, think he's he haunting it. I was walking. He could be a character in like the next series. <laughs> a kind of a, a late lamented quiz show host. Yeah. Um, so, so the decay and the distressing, it's all done for you, you don't have to... Well, no, that's not quite true. No, we that doesn't, that doesn't we matter to service to incredible designers because um, there's quite a lot that gets put in, like, all the panelling in the main room. There's, um, yeah, there's a huge amount of work that goes in doing this fantastic distressed wallpaper that's coming down, so there's yeah. actually tons. But it means things like in Series 1, there was scaffolding all over the front of the house, and that was just yeah. great for us. Yeah. Yeah, brilliant. I want to get to, there's a really good audience question, so I'm just going to slot it in now. It's from Anonymous. Don't be shy, tell us who you are. Um, it's a really good question, though. Knowing how uh, detail oriented genre fans are, did you create a rule book for ghosts and what they could and couldn't do? Because there's things with car seats yeah. and walls, and explain the basic rules of ghosts to me. Um, I, we didn't really essentially <laughs> create a rule book, it was, it was more kind of. It's tricky because obviously sitting down is nice to do when you're filming, so that had to sort of go in. Um, but also it gives you a sort of ni a nice frame. Um, I don't think Simon would have taken the job if he couldn't sit down. But, he, but it's quite hard uh, to sit down in his costume because, you know, yeah, it's yeah. like being a lady. He has yeah. to kind of keep himself, you know. Um, oh, he didn't bother. <laughs> <laughs> can we actually cut... Can but we reveal what it is, is, he covers, presumably there's something under that yeah. shirt. Okay, good. Yeah. It's like a Scotsman in his kilt. Good. Yeah. No. Oh, yeah. Um, <laughs> but yeah, there were some things, you know, some th sometimes we sort of stretch the rules in the respect that there are some episodes where you see the ghosts appear to sort of float in and out of a room. So yeah. in the first episode with Fanny when she's um, sleepwalking, yeah. sleep floating. Mm -hmm. And then I think it happens with Thomas as well when... Yeah when he floats out of the room. And we've had that a couple of times, but we've never seen them sort of fly or, sort of, you know, <laughs> elevate too high. But, um, yeah. We like the idea that they had to be stuck. And then yeah. just that thing, I mean, we had a character that, for whatever reason, I think it was because the scripts were too long and it was like, mm. and it was also something that would have, would have been tricky to keep doing. But we had a character in, I think, throughout the, f the first series that we then cut which was a guy called Pete who haunted the neighbouring property that has long since been demolished. And so he's just standing in a field. <laughs> <laughs> and and the, the idea was that it was this, ref they could always reference, oh, it could be worse. <laughs> and just sort of look out the window and there's just this guy. <sighs> <laughs> and then a, a sheep nearby would bleat and go, you can shut up. Yeah. And he was just going to be the, the example to the... It partly came from that what we wanted was a situation where they, you know, they hate these people for moving into their house and threatening to renovate it and yeah. turn it into a hotel, but that Alison could always sort of turn around and go, do you want to be like that? Right. Because <laughs> if we don't do this, this place would probably just end up demolished, yeah, and yeah. That's, that's what your fate would be. Yeah. So a reason for the ghosts to be like, actually, we've got it fairly good here. Yeah. We should pipe down. I feel like we've had the deleted scenes. I can actually see you doing that character. It's you playing him, by the way. <laughs> you know, as far as the sort of the rules of kind of touching and things, like it was, that was a sort of early idea to have one ghost who was able to sort of physically affect things, props yeah. and things, and, that was very and him yeah. being probably the most reluctant to, to do so. Yeah, yeah, just sort okay. of shit powers. The yeah. powers that aren't quite good <laughs> enough. Yeah. They are shit them. powers. Yeah. Um, we're running a little bit close on time, but I wanted to talk a bit about the writing, because obviously you are this kind of many-headed writing beast. Um, how did it break down into those? I noticed you write in pairs or sometimes solo, like sort of a Monty Python arrangement. Did that naturally occur or was it like choosing teams in PE? <laughs> it kind of has occurred naturally over time. I mean, we've done different pairings over the years between mm -hmm. Yonderland and this mm -hmm. and it still is open to change. There's never a, you know, there isn't a decision. No. But yeah, there's some natural pairings that have happened. And, and you it's, two tend to write together. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. and it's, it's always kind of based on, because we all do other jobs, it's like each time we sit and story, you know, we kind of wrangle our schedules enough to sit and storyline, mm. for, for hopefully for a week or something together. And then it's like, 
who's available now to go write these episodes yeah. and whoever's more available does a bit more and whoever's less available does a bit less. Yeah. 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 And Larry and Ben wrote Build Together, so they kind of they yeah. have that, that history of being a partnership already. So yeah. it feels kind of natural for them to do something together. So, yeah. I think it's as well from a, a family sitcom, you know, aimed at where you're aiming it, it's um, remarkably devoid of catchphrases. Is it deliberate? I mean, apart from you don't want to do a damn your eyes now, do you? No, don't. It's too early. <laughs> <laughs> that would be cheap, and we're not doing that. Um, but but there's, there's very little repetition. Is that a conscious thing, to not have catchphrases? And um, yeah, I, I think could, what's conscious is just not wanting to be lazy yeah. about writing it. Like it. Occasionally, things have come up where we've looked at them and gone, actually, that is just repeating something that worked in another episode. Mm. And that's the least challenging and least interesting thing to offer up your audience. Yeah. So we, have, we do repeat sense, them we, now. We do and again. repeat certain things. I think we'd just rather leave them as a sort of treasure rather than, yeah. a, than a catchphrase. And I think the characters are so rich, just, they've got such great voices. It's more fun to think of a different thing that yeah. Pat would say or whatever in that situation than go back. Or to we do have, a, we have got the funny well. list. Yeah. That is the only the thing funny, I think. Yeah, yeah, so but, but we, we make sure, but again, we've got again, the list to make sure we're not doing it too exactly, much, yeah. so that it's not wearing thin or becoming self-indulgent. The self challenge is like, what's an, now that we've done all the most obvious innuendos <laughs> with that name, what's the most surprising <laughs> one we can do that <laughs> still works in the context of her name and isn't just shoehorned in? And, yeah. Or like we the, twist things, like, like Alison saying, damn your eyes to Thomas, was a really lovely moment. Yeah. Next is, you know, a variation on a thing. Yeah. I like to imagine you've got like a, it's like an intimacy coach, but like someone who just raises the fanny flag when you're over <laughs> No? Yeah. <laughs> we are, so people would be surprised how strict we are about those jokes, because it does seem as though we're no, not just at all. throwing them in. Not at all, no. Um, and can we just talk a bit, um, just before we end, about the Christmas specials, because I think quite quickly they've become, certainly in our house, like it's not Christmas until we've seen the ghost Christmas oh, special. So nice. It's sort of such a brilliant... It's perfectly, I mean, it's, it, there's a glowing fireplace and it looks beautiful and it feels very Christmassy anyway, but it's such a brilliant sort of centrepiece of Christmas. Um, do you approach those specials differently? Do they, are they just another episode? Because obviously there's, there's usually a bit of stunt casting or someone interesting, mm. Jennifer Saunders last year. Well, yeah, usually this sort of series mm. arc is wrapped up by that point. So yeah. they are a sort of standalone story with... Um, a Christmassy message of some kind, yeah. um, a Christmassy lesson, or yeah. Um, so I guess that's the first point for us: is that what sort of what can we do that that feels festive? Yeah. Um, There's a different um, challenge as well on on top of the challenges of our own show and not repeating ourselves is that you've got all of the Christmas specials of the history of sitcom on your, yeah. you know, in the background of your mind. So. There's ideas we've had before where we've gone, well, you're not going to top Blackadder doing Christmas Carol. Like, mm. let's not go near a Christmas Carol. Even like th th that's, I think for the very first Christmas special, it was the first idea we had and dismissed. It was like, well, our show is called Ghosts. <laughs> if anyone is ever going to do a thing with the ghost of Christmas past and blah blah blah, yeah. mm. but it was like, well, Blackadder nailed it. So yeah. Don't go you don't need to do that again. And there's just one more really good audience question I'm going to throw in. Um, how complicated are the scenes to shoot in terms of shadows so the, so the shadows from the ghosts don't fall on the non-ghost when you're... Is that a lighting nightmare? There's no one from lighting here, but... We don't do that, do we? There are shadows, I think. Yeah. yeah. Really? Oh, you don't have shadows, yeah. no. Yeah. <laughs> we, have oh, we have shadows and wind and this and uh, elements we can yeah. Our rule very early on, by necessity, because we don't have an endless F, uh, special effects budget, mm. was if you can see ghosts, then they're real to you. Yeah. And therefore, you know, when they're, as far as Alison is concerned, they're casting shadows. And when you cut to the shot, where, from Mike's point of view, without ghosts, then they're not casting shadows. Yeah. There's a, a, um, a moment in episode three when Robin sort of has a heart to heart with Pat mm -hmm. and Thomas is in the scene. And Robin sort of leaves the scene, leaves the shot, and Thomas, it was an improv actually. Oh, yeah. Um, says, God, he stinks. 
<laughs> just to sort of pull, pull the rug from it. It's because it was such a sweet moment kind of, it needed, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> But inadvertently, that started a rule that yeah. was like, yes. oh, okay, the ghosts can smell each other. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Which kind of led to the, the physical fight they have in the wedding. We were like, oh, they could yes. touch each other. They can't touch anything else, but they could touch each other. Yeah. And also because they're ghosts, it would reset so they can have a massive punch up. <laughs> and be fine. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And presumably the brilliant rule about it being really unpleasant for a ghost to experience a human going through them, it means you can shoot some scenes and they all just get out of yeah. the way yeah. When, yeah, totally, when Mike's yeah. charging down the yeah. corridor. Yeah. You it's spotted just the... Cheating. <laughs> yeah. 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 It but it's good practical. cheating. It's very good cheating. Um, listen, we're running very low on time, um, but uh, I did promise you a treat. Um, so, Charlie in the booth, if you're ready. Um, Making its world premiere, yes. We have got, uh, for the first time anywhere in the world, a first look teaser for series four of Ghosts. <laughs> That looks pretty good, doesn't it? Um, it's, it's back in September, we can confirm, so you haven't got long to wait. And there is a Christmas special. Yes! So happy. <laughs> so, so happy. Um, thank you so much. Thank you for getting up so early and, and coming. It was really appreciated. I really enjoyed that. Um, thank you to the Edinburgh TV Festival for hosting this. Thank you to Charlie Coombs over there who organised this whole session and is a producing genius. And, um, and thank you for coming. It's been really fun, really interesting. Um, so please join me in thanking our brilliant panellists, Matthew Bainton, Jim Howick, Lolly Adafopi, Kyle Smith-Bino, Alison Carpenter, and John Petrie. Thank you.